afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for the AI Ohio Advocacy Series program, Implementing a Successful Advocacy Program. And Karen Planet is going to get us started. Thanks, Kate. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the fifth program in the 2021 Advocacy Series entitled Implementing a Successful Advocacy Plan. Joining us today is a distinguished panel from components across the country that will be sharing their experience and expertise on how advocacy committees are organized and what it takes to make them thrive. Before we start today's program, I would like to recognize and thank all of our 2021 AI Ohio annual sponsors, highlight on the screen now. Our sponsors are important partners who have helped us present the innovative and quality programming we've been enjoying this year. We also have some great news to share today. Senate Bill 49, the payment assurance uh, for design professionals was recently passed by the House and Senate. Our bill is on the governor's desk currently and he's expected to sign it. Uh, this type of proactive legislation is not possible without the support of the 2021 AIA Ohio PAC contributors, many of which are with us today. If you've not already, please consider joining your fellow colleagues and making a contribution to the AI Ohio PAC so that we can continue to have a strong voice advocating for the profession in the state of Ohio. Uh, please mark your calendar now for the final session of this year's advocacy series entitled Stories of Advocate Architects. It'll be scheduled for Wednesday, July 21st. We'll be hearing from AI Ohio members across the state about how they were able to become passionate advocates for the profession. I hope to see everyone in July and that you continue to engage in Ohio's advocacy efforts throughout the year. Finally, I'd like to introduce and thank the advocacy series committee members. My co-chair, Bruce Sikanik, FAIA from AIA Youngstown, Matt Toddy, AIA from AIA Columbus, and our executive director, Kate Brunswick. Just a few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled for one and one half hours. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. We will have, we will be hosting Q&A session at the, um, throughout the presentation today and also at the end of the program. So, you know, when you think of your question, please certainly put it in the chat box. Um, there will be a link that we'll drop in the chat box about 1.15 today, and you can follow that to receive your learning units for today's program. So to start today's program, I'm gonna take about 20 minutes to get to know our panelists and uh, learn about how their chapters advocacy committees are organized. Let's see. So I'm gonna start out with joining us from AIA Seattle today is Kirsten Smith. She's the manager of policy and advocacy. Uh, good morning, Kirsten. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, including sort of your role at AIA Seattle and how your chapter's advocacy program is organized. Uh, thank you very much for having me. So I actually work for both AIA Seattle and AIA Washington Council, the state uh, entity. And I'm gonna speak today about my AIA Seattle um, piece, but I am the policy and advocacy staff at both entities. I'm the only staff who works on um, policy and advocacy. And it's not, that typical for a state a city component or a local component to have a dedicated staff for policy. So um, I came in to a fully functioning policy framework when I came to AIA Seattle four years ago. And so that has been nice that I just got to step in and then sort of um, work and improve, um, but everything had been already set up. So I was lucky that way. Our policy uh, framework at AIA Seattle is run through our what we call the Public Policy Board, the PPB. And that entity really runs our chapter's advocacy direction, our policy statements, the work that we do. The PPB meets twice a whole month and spends a lot of time on email in between those uh, meetings. Our board does make overall very large policy decisions regarding direction. And then within those large directions, the PPB has quite a bit of latitude about um, how it functions. We have identified some areas where we need more work than the PPB has the uh, capacity to do. So we have task forces underneath that PPB. Uh, one of them is housing, uh, which is focused on housing policy in the city of Seattle, really on uh, getting more density, zoning, 
um, and being able to uh, just provide a lot more housing in general, uh, which is, I would say, Seattle's number one uh, public policy issue in general. We have one for transportation, and we actually have one for homelessness. Uh, we had a lot of younger members, uh, the professionals who were really interested in the homelessness issue in Seattle, which is a big problem like many other cities. And so we have a group that um, has been working not only on policy there, but also service um, and opportunities to um, get involved with design in the area of providing shelter for um, individuals experiencing homelessness. So that's in short how our policy structure works. Um, and I sort of manage and cajole all those efforts, but it really depends as off everything at AIA does on a lot of volunteers who are interested and willing to put in the time uh, to address our advocacy interests. So I'll stop there. Thanks again for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. Thanks, you. Appreciate that. We'll move on now. So we have three panelists from AIA Middle Tennessee. Um, the first one to introduce, please, is uh, Carol Pedigo. She's Honorary AIA Executive Director of AIA Middle Tennessee. Carol, same thing. Could you tell us a little bit about your role um, in advocacy for your chapter and uh, maybe a little bit about how your program is organized? Thank you so much for having us today. This is such an important topic. And Kate, hats off to you and your team for actually pulling this kind of focus on advocacy together. Largely AIA Middle Tennessee for the past 27 years of my um, relationship as executive director with them, basically they've been allergic to advocacy. And just with the COVID-19 vaccine, I think we may begin to start to wheel away at that, at that resistance to be advocates for their profession. It uh, became part of my role for the first time at a local capacity at a 2016 or 17 planning retreat for our strategic direction. And it was the first time that our board said, we wanna focus on this. Um, with that being said, the first thing we did was to find the leaders to try and marry our advocacy efforts along with our state chapter and along with our national direction. So we thought we were doing really, really well. And then COVID hit and uh, a tornado and gosh, civil unrest. So many things happened. So our plan that our committee had put together so well learned the hard way how to adapt and change. And I think that's what most advocacy programs struggle with. With that, um, thank you for having us today. Thanks, Carol. Uh, next up is Kelsey I'm gonna, Ospin. Uh, maybe you could introduce yourself and tell us how you got involved with AI Middle Tennessee's advocacy program and um, you know how you find um, members to get engaged in the efforts. Sure, um, and I'll echo the thanks for having us today. Um, our advocacy committee, our, technically our government relations committee, um, is pretty new. We, uh, I guess, formally started in December of 2019. Um, Whitney and Carol had approached me as I was rolling off of our emerging professionals uh, committee, um, and uh, we sort of jumped into a, a brand new endeavor, uh, which is really exciting. Um, we recruited a couple of folks to, to help out on the committee. So we're currently at a team of eight plus our two wonderful staff. Um, and we sort of went through the national initiatives to look at what was the most relevant and pressing um, here in Nashville and Middle Tennessee. Um, and so we have five initiatives, uh, some national alignment, and then some local priorities that have come up. Um, but as, uh, as Carol mentioned, the best laid plans. Um, and so we've sort of been balancing since we started um, the need to both be proactive and, and think long-term about what we really want to achieve in terms of advocacy. Um, and then also listening to our members and being really responsive to what they're seeing happening in the community and where we can lend our voice to, um, to really urgent needs. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, and our third representative from AIA Middle Tennessee is Whitney Johnson, Associate AIA. Whitney, maybe you could introduce yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Whitney Johnson. I am the um, on the board of directors for AI Middle Tennessee, and I serve as the board liaison for the government relations committee. So my role is to really be a part of 
all the decision making that goes in with the committee and also kind of relay those back to Carol and the rest of our executive board um, just to make sure that, you know, we're hearing things and we're seeing things and we're um, responding to a lot of uh, things and issues that are happening throughout our city, um, our counties and um, the profession. So, yeah, that's my role. <laughs> Thanks, Whitney. No and our, our third component joining us today is AIA South Carolina. So Adrian Monter, FAIA Executive Director of AIA South Carolina. Could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how South Carolina's uh, advocacy programs organized? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, like everyone else, thank you so much for having us. Jonathan and I are really excited to be here. This advocacy um, series is such a great idea. I think we're gonna be inspir inspired to borrow slash copy slash steal it. Um, it, it. It's a fabulous way to engage the membership on like different aspects of advocacy. Um, I'm a registered lobbyist, but um, recently we were able to um, budget for getting a contract lobbyist, which is something we hadn't been able to have, we didn't have the financial resources to do until um, uh, several years ago. Um, so I work as kind of the practice and policy um, in-house expert, and I consult with our contract lobbyists who then go and um, lobby for us um, at the state house. I also serve as an advisor on many of the government agencies and I sit in on our licensing board, trying to keep the practice and policy issues, you know, front of mind. Um, we were established, our advocacy committee was established in 2015, following our repositioning, restructuring of the chapter. And um, it's always been the number one priority whenever we've done a member survey, they say advocacy is what the state component um, should focus on, it's what you, you all do best. Um, and that drove us to look at, you know, coming up with the financial resources to hire a contract um, lobbying firm, um, making sure that we have a robust committee that has representatives from all, we have um, six local sections um, and they're all volunteer components. We only have staff at the, at the state level. So it is a, you know, volunteer led effort. Um, our advocacy committee um, meets, we meet monthly. Um, we do um, uh, uh, periodic um, updates. Um, to our members, and we have members of our um, PAC uh, board um, sit on the advocacy committee representing, as well as um, we have the our lobbyists, we have a representative from the licensing board, and um, brand new, we're going to bring in some of our knowledge communities. We realize that we need to have other um, members' um, expertise, like our CRAN group. We had a home builders bill that we um, were, we lost, um, the battle earlier this year and we decided after we heard from some of our residential architects, our advocacy committee was missing voices from, um, from the residential um, side of the um, profession. So um, we're kind of newish, I guess, so we're about six years old and we, and Jonathan is government affairs and we also have a practice and they are co-directors. So um, we're very excited to be here and thank you again. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, and our final panelist from AIA South Carolina is Jonathan Garvin, AIA Advocacy Director. Jonathan, could you introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about how you got involved in advocacy with South Carolina? Sure, um, and, and, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, as Adrian had said, I, um, I worked my, rank, my way up the ranks through our local section. So I was in AIA Greenville and worked up through leadership there and then now at the state level, uh, code code directing with, with our practice uh, director for our advocacy group, um, and it was I think what compelled me to particularly this realm was um, it, at the city level um, we uh, we had to do a lot to, to to bring groups together in order to to accomplish uh, what we were endeavoring to accomplish because our our um, um, group was was kind of dwindling as far as retention so we really needed to bring uh, groups together and and seeing the power that came from kind of reaching across uh, those allied groups um, at the state level um, I've been able to see the same the same uh, 
uh, effort moving forward. And, and to Adrian's point, I think it's, you know, we've realized even as we've looked internally, um, how we can reach back out uh, in particular um, to our CRAN groups and, and re-energize uh, some of our local sectors. So all of our committee is made up of the volunteer groups um, from each advocacy uh, section within the local sections. And so now we're looking to kind of broaden our, our reach and, and deepen our bench and, and kind of reach out to those in order to um, re-energize uh, that group. So uh, very exciting. Uh, and, and again, back to the idea that we had to adapt uh, to kind of what our initial agenda was from our two years ago at our retreat to, to where we are now. So thanks again. Excellent. Welcome. So I, I do have a little announcement I do get to make. So AI Ohio was selected to present information about the pro, like the program that we put together here today, part of this series at the Architects in Action SLGN conference that will be coming up. So we'll be sharing how we put this program together with um, all the other um, advocacy components in the across the country. So just a little treat. Um, so now that we've had a chance to meet all of our panelists and get a better understanding of how their chapters advocacy programs are organized, I'd like to turn the program over to Bruce for a deeper dive into the workings of your committees. Bruce? I have to get myself off of mute and, and enough time. So, well, thank you, Karen. Um, the next portion, which is going to be about 20 minutes as well, um, we wanted to throw out some questions to all of our panelists. Uh, to get your opinions and feedback on how you deal with issues or topics that might arise as part of a components advocacy program. Uh, these are um, general questions, so any of our panelists can feel free to contribute, or, or maybe once someone contributes, uh, offer an opposing viewpoint. So um, we do know that not all issues are created equally. Some have a bigger impact, while others require a lot more bandwidth and resources. So the first question is, uh, and, and I think Kirsten covered this very well for Seattle already, you know, with, with their, their public uh, policy board, but how, how do you evaluate what issues you want to include as part of your advocacy agenda? Um, how do you sit down and go through that process? Maybe Adrian, maybe you can throw something out to us from South Carolina here. Yeah, absolutely. So we get together um, towards the end of the year in our regular um, chapter board retreat. So that would be, you know, directors from that sit on all the different committees and kind of pick up on the general direction from the board of anything that over the year they think might be a priority. Then the advocacy committee um, convenes because usually in January, we have a two year session that goes from January to April. And usually in January, we hold a legislative reception with um, the contractors, AGC, and the engineers, ACEC, SPE, and ASCE. Um, there's 12 societies of engineers in South Carolina and I always, I always get the acronyms all, all confused. Um, <laughs> So we that we do a brochure. The the three, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, groups get together to, to to print out a brochure that we then hand out to legislators at the reception and um, when we go and visit them in the state house. And that's like our deadline. That's where we know we have to have our legislative agenda for the year. And that's usually the second um, uh, week of January when we've had those. Um, obviously due to COVID, those have been canceled the last two years. So we're kind of forced, we have the forced deadline that by January, um, early January, we have our legislative agenda um, in place and, and basically the advocacy committee um, you know, develops it and um, the board has already kind of given us the go ahead at the November retreat. So we don't necessarily check back in with them. It's kind of like, you know, it's, it's looking good. Keep, you know, keep at it. Let us know how we can help. So that's how we come up with our legislative agenda. And unfortunately, a lot of it, um, at least half of it is always reactive, reactive to whatever legislation has, <laughs> has either happened, has come up the previous year here in South Carolina, 
or the nasty bits that come from Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina that we know we're going to see at the state house that year. So um, it's it's a it's a you know it's a good time because we get kind of excited about prioritizing. And then as for resources, um, there like you said, some of these like for instance, um, we haven't seen it in a while, but the if it, the interior designer um, uh, licensing act comes back that's something where um, we might have to find some financial resources to broaden the scope of our um, lobbying effort. Um, and then of course, you know, grabbing the coalition members. What other stakeholders would be affected by this? And then we've been very, very successful that way. The bigger the coalition, the more successful we are. And I would say, sorry to take the time, but the reason we lost the home builders was one, we didn't realize from the perspective of the residential architects, that that little tiny thing that we thought wasn't a big deal was a larger deal. And also we were the only ones left standing. Um, all the other stakeholders just didn't feel like they had, including the building officials. So when we have to stand alone, we find we have much, much less um, power for lack of a better word. And that's a great summary. I, I appreciate that because I, I think many of us have seen that in the past as well, that, uh, yeah, coalition building is an important part of what we do. So thank, thank you for that, Adrian. Uh, Whitney or Kelsey, how about the, from your perspective, uh, same question. Yeah, it's interesting um, working at the local level because our city government um, obviously functions differently. And so we don't often have uh, much of a lead time when something does come up. Um, so we, we do have to and are still working on becoming more um, kind of agile and responsive. Um, often it's things that members will highlight and say, hey, have you heard about this? Or, you know, we'll skim the city council agenda every other week and um and see if anything is relevant to, to our industry. Um, occasionally we'll have council members who have become really good partners and will bring things to us as they're in development or draft form. Um, and we're able to kind of uh, bring members together around those and have a little bit more advanced notice to, um, to do a call to action. So um, we're hoping to get into more of that kind of proactive, uh, again, coalition building and relationship building. Um, but often we're uh, we're moving pretty quickly to to rally the troops. Yeah, yeah, and she summed it up perfectly. Um, a lot of what we we are so new, and when we started, everything we were getting um, was basically we had to react to um, pretty quickly and pretty swiftly. So we have not had the ability yet to develop a legislative agenda, as she said. But we are hoping to get there um, and be more proactive around the area in the future. Great. So it's, it sounds like you actually have to put in a lot of work every every other week to make sure you go through that agenda, or you're going to find yourself cut out of the process at some point. So now that, that's good for everyone to know. I, I think that's important, especially because local is so much different, I think, than state. State has a much longer process in place. At a local component, things can happen overnight. So you yes. never know what the council is going to do. So that, that's great to hear. Great to hear. Um, I, I'm going to ask a, a different question for, again, this is all, all three components. Um, you know, a lot of this, I think, depends on, on just what's happening in the session time or, or, or when the council's meeting, when they're in recess or whatever. But about how many issues are you to typically focusing on at one time? I think that's important for our components to understand, you know, is, is it you're really um, maybe a state local looking at two, three, or four important ones, you know, plus the ones you're responding to? Or is it um, you're trying to just push really one big one and, and you know, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, the, the, the really the responsive ones as opposed to being reactive, the proactive ones are just limited to one or two things that you can do with your bandwidth. So, again, anyone? So, I find in our components, both at the state and the city level, um, we tend to get mission creep and architects are just very interested in things beyond practice issues, which I love. Um, but we end up having to step back and ask the question, where do architects have a unique voice? So for example, at the city level, when it comes to the issue of housing, there's tons of, of pieces of the housing puzzle, but where do we have a unique voice? We, have a, we know a lot about code. We know a lot about zoning. Um, we know a lot more than most of the advocacy organizations who are working in the housing area. So we try to focus our work in that area. We try to focus our outreach to council in that area. Um, 
and on the other, you know, on the other side, like, so I mentioned that we were really interested in the issue of homelessness, but we architects don't necessarily have a great, um, a, a unique voice on the issue of homelessness. We can offer skills in designing um, tiny homes and, and ideas around how, um, how prototypes can be developed, but we don't have a strong policy voice. And so we actually have taken a little bit of a step back um, there because I just don't have a direction that we can go where we offer something different than all the other advocacy organizations. We can sign on to all of their, all of their pleas to city government, support them, but um, that's sort of how we try to rein in Mission Creek. Um, sometimes successful and sometimes not. <laughs> well, that, that, that's good to know. And I, I think that is really important because sometimes you just stretch so thin. It's just, it's just very hard. And, and I think we've been cautioned in the past too. It's just like focus on the things you really know. And, and that's so important. So thank you, Carson. I appreciate that. Uh, other thoughts from uh, Carol or anyone else? I would say for us in South Carolina, Adrian, you can certainly keep me between the between the rails. But I would say we probably have three or, or three or four uh, items that are probably ones that we kind of identified in the, in the start of the year that are, are to the forefront. But that we but that I would also say we probably have maybe one or two that are are deeper, longer stretch ones that we know you know it's probably not even a two year window. We know it's going to take even longer than that. So, you know, I'd, I'd say they're almost a, a stretch goal. Some of it by the by the passion of the people that are part of the committee and part of it from what we know um, other groups are also interested in. So it's going to take some time for us to, to strategize that. So, um, and, and I think that, that kind of helps because we have the ones that we at least feel like we're strategically positioning for than the ones that are actually kind of facing us most imminently, um, which is a good, a good blend. So you don't always feel like you're rea you know, reacting. So right. Right. That's, that's where I, I would say we are right now. Okay, well, great. I'm, I'm going to kind of change up here because we, we want to keep things on time and give everyone the chance to, to uh, express their opinions on certain things. But uh, in advocacy, we had this desire to focus and that was a great segue uh, between proactive and reactive advocacy work, or at least have some type of balance on that. Um, and we all know that being proactive is is not the easiest. Uh, you know, reactive is because you have to do it. Proactive is, well, you know, uh, how you can put things together and build that co coalition and, and work towards um, achieving what you're after. So let me ask you a question, and I'm going to uh, throw this out, uh, I think maybe Kirsten, uh, to you again first. Um, so how successful have you been at creating that balance? Weren't sure public policy board puts things in place and, and how successful has that been? And, um, you know, it, where have you found your most successes? Have those occurred being proactive or reactive? And do you know why? There's a lot in that question. <laughs> so interestingly, um, thinking through that question as you're speaking, I find, because I do both state and local work, I find the state is much more reactive. And it's because there's a definite timeline. You got to get done in the session and um, things are coming up and you don't know about them. And at the city level, it's, it's just a longer timeline. They don't have the same deadlines with the exception of budget. Um, so, you know, things are coming uh, generally, you know, before they, they don't pop up as much. Um, and as Kelsey mentioned, sometimes you do get to a relationship where a city council member will come to you and say, hey, I'm thinking about this. Can you support it publicly? Can you offer comments on it? And for me, that's the, um, that's the end all be all of advocacy is when you have those relationships where they're coming to you. And I would say at the city council in Seattle, we have two members who would do that out of nine. Um, but um, so for me, um, the proactive uh, is just much more, uh, much more able to be proactive at the local level uh, because things just have a longer timeline. And um, I'm not quite sure how to measure success. Uh, they're, they're just very different. Um, I think for the proactive side, measuring success is, is again, having that ability to offer input before things are, are, um, are considered at council, but also um, just being able to work on an issue for the long term and have those early meetings and talk about you know, what's important, um, not for architects as much as for the city um, and have those stakeholder relationships. So to me, the, the proactive piece feels much more successful and the reactive piece feels like, oh, we dodged that bullet. Like, <laughs> so, um, and there's success in that too. Um, obviously, it's, it's it, it, but it's uh, um, it feels much more chaotic 
and therefore um, maybe not as successful. I'm not sure that I answered all your questions, but. No, no, I think you did very, very well. I, I like the dodge the bullet. I think most of us, when you said that, can relate to that because it, it often feels like what advocacy is mostly about sometimes. But um, I'm going to jump back to Kelsey because I think in some ways what she just said is kind of opposite to what you told us earlier because you said, you know, you don't often know what's coming up. And she, and, and as, as Kirsten was saying it, she said, you have longer lead time and everything at the city level. And you're talking to the level and say, well, it just comes upon us quickly. So maybe offer your, your thoughts on that. And, and you know, and, and again, answer the question with the, the proactive versus reactive. Yeah, well, I was going to start by saying how jealous I am that you have a nine person council, because I think one of our challenges is that we have 40 members of our city council. Um, which is part of the challenge of, you know, keeping track of what's happening and where and who's focused on, on which issues. Um, so that being said, um, I think for us, the proactive reactive conversation is also sort of a general versus specific. Um, for us on the proactive side, it's, it's really more about that relationship building and education and um, connecting uh, policymakers and um, and folks who need technical expertise with our members who can offer that. Um, and then on the reactive side, it tends to be more specific policy concerns that either members or um, or or policymakers bring to us and say, you know, what do you think? Or I'm worried about this and how it might impact our membership. So um, we had, I think, our first like real kind of test run of our advocacy committee um, was on that reactive side. And so it was a, a quick learning curve of, um, you know, responding to a concern that a member brought about how legislation about um, lobbyists and how those uh, interact with, with Metro Council members, um, how they're required to register and the ethics about that. Um, how that could be interpreted to apply to our membership who are working on things like zoning changes. So um, that was one of those really specific things that we hadn't anticipated and it was certainly not a proactive thing, um, but I think we had a, a pretty successful response to that. That's great. Um, so uh, Whitney or Carol, any further thoughts on that from? Uh, yeah, that one. <laughs> That first one we got was fun. Uh, it was a lot of long hours <laughs> uh, right off the bat to get our feet wet. We really did have to dive into something that was really, really specific and really hard hitting, something that could have affected, um, like she said, our membership and also other, other professions and other industries that we do deal with. Um, and also something that we thought was like really successful was that is that we did have to build a coalition, I think two of them at least, uh, pretty quickly to really get opinions and get the feel from other industries and stuff and how what type of support we would have on this and how we could communicate with that policymaker, um, getting a feel for um, their intentions with it, um, even though it may not have been intentional to affect us as much as it could have, but just knowing um, that those those type of implications of such legislation can happen and knowing that we do have to really be, um, you know, steadfast with that and how and how we kind of serve our membership with that. And so that one, that one was fun. Yeah, it was a really big learning curve for all of us, I think. I think one of the things I'll add to that is how imperative coalitions are, not only within our partners and allied industry members, but our internal coalition with our staff at the state level and at the, uh, at the lobbying level. Uh, Ashley Cates is on this call and Angel, Angel Wings on that woman's back because we're new at this and she is, she's a pro and, um, uh, Along with that, Adrian, I heard you say that you're just now getting a lobbyist. We have a phenomenal lobbyist team at our state, and, and they rallied with us on that, on that lobbyist issue, which would have prohibited our architects from serving on the zoning commission and on the codes commission. It would have, it would have taken us out of play in a critical area that actually services our, our voting public in our community. That's great. And uh, Kirsten, did I see you wanted to step in with a quick comment? So, 
I just wanted to say your comments made me wonder, like, why, why are we getting advanced notice? And I would say that it's because we have members on the Seattle Planning Commission and they get more information than we do and they tell us that information. So if you have a planning commission, get your architects on it um, because I get a lot of information from them. Okay, that's, that's great. So uh, Jonathan and Adrian, uh, same, same question, I guess, for South Carolina here to, to ask that out. Uh, your, your, your thoughts on the successes in the proactive agenda? versus reactive. <laughs> um, well, I, I hate to say the jury may still be out on our proactive uh, one, but we, we, we have been laying the groundwork since I, I think since I started two and a half years ago. So it's, uh, it's a very slow burn. Um, so I would like to report maybe in a year's time that it's been a successful effort. Uh, <laughs> but um, as far as the, um, the, the shorter term ones, I think it's I think it's been very successful in part to to both um, our kind of preparation for that for that January uh, legislative um, reception and then our work with our lobbyists. I think one of the things that I've certainly learned is, and I think others have um, hinted at it, is the you know even the unintended consequences. So we we really look at um, you know even an item that might seem relatively small, looking at Kind of how it relates, not just to you know our profession, but you know allied professions, and, and I think a lot of that has been between us and the engineers. So um, our, our lobbyists really have helped us. I think take a very critical eye um, each one of these months that we review. You know the ones that we identified early on in the year, and then the ones that kind of are the quicker hits that come in. I will say, you know, I think we, I think Adrian and I both feel a little bit. Um, uh, I don't know. We look back on this latest one with the home builders, and you know, I think we we feel you know, there's things that that we could have done. But I think you know the other takeaway from that is that we've used it as an action point to just strengthen um, our committee and and probably uh, deepen it. So you know, maybe it's a it's a it's a small loss for maybe a greater win uh, in our preparation for the next one. So I don't know if I I think I probably talked around your question, but um, <laughs> that's uh, that's my thoughts on it. I don't know if Adrian has more to add. Yeah, well, it's also not um, to uh, Bruce's question, but the, the positive, the silver lining maybe to that cloud was that in engaging our CRAN members, our residential architects, we reminded them, because they had, you know, if anyone remembers, what was it about 20 years ago, the CRAN, the residential architects were like, you know, what does, what's AIA done for me lately? Everything's focused to the large firms and I'm not a large firm. And so we, we now, it, we, it was almost like we were able to like throw it back to them and say, this is how you can help us help you. And advocacy is more than just when we ask you to make a pack donation or when we ask you to <laughs> whatever, um, this is directly related. So now I think we have activated these members who are like, oh, if I need the state component to fight for me on these residential practice issues, I need to be the one coming to the state house and testifying and I need to find out who on my committee is in the district of the sponsor of the bill that is going to affect our practice. So all of a sudden we realize it's just this beautiful, um, uh, boy, I'm really bad with the analogies today, but snowball effect that came out of what was, you know, a fail, which is that we did, um, uh, you know, have something put into our practice act that we would prefer not to have. Um, and uh, so it, it's really, it's just it's got, it's come full circle where we all of a sudden didn't realize that this was the perfect way to promote the importance of being um, involved as an advocate that it's not just you know paying your dues or it's not just focusing on one or other things that the component can do for you but that you're actually going to be able to help the component um, um, you know be successful in that regard for the proactive it is always a heavier lift. Um, especially if you find yourself 
um, maybe the only um, one in your kind of group of, of usual suspects of stakeholders and, and coalition members. Um, we are taking on a really, really big chew, a big bite rather. Um, Jonathan, I'm just gonna go and spill the beans and maybe then you all can hold us to it if we don't succeed in two years. We're trying to see if we can get the South Carolina legislature to adopt the 2018 Energy Conservation Code. We are stuck in the 2009, even though all our other codes are up to the 2018. And we thought it was like a baby steps. Um, it's, it's a big lift. We did um, work with the home builders so that we removed residential. So this is just gonna be for commercial buildings. And that's the only way we could get them not to fight us at the state house. Um, we think we have a very, very large coalition. We think we have a big stakeholder pool. We think, you know, dot, dot, dot. But we do have the reality of so many members of the General Assembly who are against building codes, let alone energy, let alone anything that seems, you know, like it's, they, they, they still will tell us, well, we don't like that code because it's international, you know, because we adopted the ICC 20 years ago. So what, we need to have our own code. So these are the kinds of things. So the, the proactive is always the heavier push, but again, the success will be with our coalition. If we can get that, I think we'll be, we'll be okay. So you all just call us in about two years and hopefully we'll be able to give you good news. Well, that that's good to hear. Hopefully, we we will hear that, Adrian. We appreciate that. Um, we're we're going we're going to uh, transition a little bit here into some of the other questions um, that are specific to your programs. But I, I just wanted to get a, a quick uh, kind of shout out from each of the three components on who you include in with as as the coalitions that you build. So, uh, Kirsten from Seattle, who who's included in there outside of the AIA that that you regularly work with? Um, it, in the city, it really depends on the topic. Uh, so we, we work with the, you know, the ACECs and the AGCs at the state level, but not so much at the city. So a lot of the um, nonprofits working on climate, working on uh, housing um, are, are really our primary. Uh, uh, so, so, so at the local level, it's, it's more topic type oriented coalitions and state, it's more of the general ones that we all deal with, with engineers. Right. And Okay, yeah. Carol, Carol, how about you? I'm sorry. Oh gosh, we've got much to mirror Kristen's. Um, Kelsey can tell you, I think on the coalition side of it, we're probably up to over 20 some odd different groups that we're trying to, to, to blend with. And it is about the topic, but with the lobbyist issue that we, we went to, we, we went into that um, to the regime of the landscape architect the regime of the engineer, the contractor. And much as, as Adrian has said, we found ourselves standing alone, even though we felt like we were in the right to, to take that mantle for most of them. And we found at, at the local level that uh, the, the politics of being fearful that tar is gonna stick to you if you ever step, step on that uh, limb alone, uh, that, that it will stay with you forever. I, I think it worked in our favor. Um, but again, kudos to the coalition that stepped up there with us, kind of, we're not going out there with you, but say this <laughs> kind of a thing. Right, right. All right, thank, thank you. And finally, uh, Jonathan and Adrian, your, your, uh, your comments on that, Who's, who are your coalitions that you work with? Uh, well, I, I think uh, uh, AGC certainly and, and, and the engineering groups and, and, and for this uh, latest one, I think we've been talking with USGBC and, and certainly our um, energy commissions. Um, but I mean, I think it, it really runs the gamut depending on the topic. I think the latest one, you know, we were kind of sad to find out that the, the code officials who we are typically are, are one that we are in step with, well, they kind of fell away. Uh, but we're at the state level, it really is um, a lot with the AGC as part of our practice director. He runs a joint committee with that group as well. So we find that, you know, and certainly when the architects and the contractors can be together, it, it certainly provides a good uh, base. 
Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you. I, I thank you all for your thoughts on this. Um, and I think they'll uh, be very helpful to our components as we, as each of the components, you know, with different levels, different sizes, and anything work towards, uh, towards their advocacy uh, program. Um, a few weeks ago, we had a nice discussion with each of our panelists. And uh, for the third part of today's presentation, we're gonna focus on a few specific questions uh, on how your component works. Uh, for this, I'm gonna pass the uh, baton over to Matt Toddy to focus on component specific questions. Matt? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, so, you know, this is this has been a really good conversation. And I, you know, I'd like to take maybe a little bit deeper dive um, Kirsten, if you don't mind, if we if we start talking a little bit more about your program, um, obviously you, you have a large chapter there in Seattle, but you also have a really high level of engagement. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the number of people you have kind of showing up for for this advocacy work, and then how you keep them engaged on a kind of you know issue issue by issue basis? Yeah, I, I think we do have a high number of engagement, and yet it feels like it's not enough. Um, always. Um, so I'm always struggling with how do we reach the members who never engage in advocacy? Um, how do we even engage in their thinking if we never hear from them? Um, so we struggle with that. But the, how we focus on getting more people involved is really getting that information out there. So making sure that um, we send we send a dedicated email and our members complain, they get emails constantly from AIA, but once a month, they get an email from AIA Seattle specifically on advocacy. And I am, it's not because of me, but I'm super proud that it is the most open um, email of that, that AIA Seattle has. And they, they shouldn't have told me that because I tell everyone that. Um, but it covers, you know, it, it, I feel that it covers, you know, what's going on in the city and then it lets people choose and pick what they want to read about. Um, we offer ways for them to get engaged. So email your council members about this. Here's more information about that. Click here. Um, and so that is a way, you know, we, don't, we certainly don't reach all members. When I say the highest open rate, it's like 35%. <laughs> but, but it still reaches people who are interested. Um, and it offers a gateway to how they can get involved in different things. So not only events that we have to put on, like we're doing, um, we have a mayoral race this year and we're doing candidate um, forums for those race, that race and other races. Um, so it offers like, here's some things you can, you can watch. Um, here's some advocacy opportunities. Here's the committee meetings that are meeting about various opportunities. Um, so really that's the way that we um, try to get more people involved. And as soon as I get an email from someone, I'm like on them like, okay, I, you know, let's have, let's, have a, let's have a discussion. Let's talk about what you're interested in, how we address that, um, how you can be involved in some of our efforts. Um, I wish I could do more. I wish, I, I, I'm constantly trying to figure out how to get more people involved um, because like probably most components, our core advocacy work is done by a, really a small number of people um, who are very, very active. And we're not getting voices outside of that very active community. Um, so I struggle with it. But our, our main, ad, our main um, attack is to have lots of opportunities in which to engage and then make sure that the members are aware of that with a lot of information going on. That's, that's, that's great. Um, I think there's a lot of really good information there. I, I, I'm curious also, you know, obviously, Seattle, um, you, you know, on the West Coast there, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how do, you, how do you go about navigating political differences when the legislature, you know, leans so heavily to one side of the aisle? And unfortunately, I can only report that AIA, um, Seattle, and Washington Council lean so heavily to one side of the aisle. Um, and I'm not proud of it. Um, our members, 80% of our members in the state come from Seattle, and it's just a very, very um, blue place. And so um, we do hear from some other members sometimes, and I want to be responsive to them, but it's hard when the vast majority of members are pushing in one direction. Um, and what happens, I think, is that we just they just sort of give up on advocacy at AIA. They're involved in AIA for other reasons, and those members sort of, um, sort of disengage, which isn't good. Um, so we struggled. We struggled with how can we be more relevant, frankly, to Republicans in our legislature who, um, who have become very um, obstructionist uh, for a lot of policies because that's all they can do as a minority um, party. And it's not a situation where, oh, maybe in, in four years we're going to be in charge of the, um, of the legislature. They're just not. We haven't had a Republican governor since 1985. Um, so we do lean um, much more heavily towards the left than ACEC, than the entire construction industry. Um, I hear about it from them all the time. 
um, particularly on things like climate, um, on things that would cost more for it to build housing. Um, so it, it is a struggle. Um, and I, I feel like we're doing some of our members a disservice, I'll be honest. And I, I struggle with that and I don't quite know how to um, address it. Um, the thing I fall back on all the time is our board ultimately decides what our policy is for both entities. So our board at the state level, um, including representatives from the areas who are typically um, more Republican leaning, um, are, are um, coming to a consensus on our policies around climate and housing and everything else. So that's sort of my backstop, but it doesn't address the members who feel that they aren't being heard at AIA. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. I, and I'm, I'd love to open that question up to, uh, to, to the other panelists as well, if there's any, um, any input that you'd like to share. Maybe Adrian, if, I, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot on that one. Yeah, no, <laughs> you're not putting me on the spot. This is something that we um, have struggled with um, even before we were in this new iteration of the advocacy committee, being both government affairs and practice um, combined um, for the, the almost 30 years that I've been in South Carolina, um, I've been aware that the chapter, you know, what we do is we wind up really focusing on policy issues. So when we have um, gone into something that might be um, a little bit more considered politically to be more on the progressive side, we've, the, 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 the way we um, message it to our members to get them involved is how it's going to affect the architect's practice. This is going to affect you in your practice. So we hit the energy and environmental issues through the impact it has on their day-to-day -day practices. Um, and that I think with, we have, um, we're in an unusual state in the sense that I think we only have maybe two firms in the entire state. I and mean, there have to be well over um, 300 firms in South Carolina that are more than 35 people. And they're both several hundred people and in several states. And that's only two firms. Everyone else is you know, less than 35 people, very small. A lot of our folks are sole proprietors you know, um, on the coast doing um, custom residential work. So it's a broad, diverse crowd in that sense. Um, and so we have not yet as a board or as a component or as a committee come up with something that might um, n uh, that, that might cause a, a rift between progressive versus conservative members because it's just been our attack out of um, just you know just kind of our operational method is just to focus on on practice. So with the energy code, it's going to be very interesting. We think we are going to have our members with us. We're going to continue to get it out there. If we hear from any members, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just interesting when you do and when you don't hear from your members, when you get those emails out, letting them know something that's coming up. So that is how we evade any potential <laughs> conflict. And I'm, I'm sure you do hear about it when there is uh, dissenting opinion. Yes, we do. Okay. Yes, we do. Uh, Carol, anything that you want to add to that conversation? NIA Middle Tennessee is comprised of 35 counties. There are 95 in the state of Tennessee. Our mayor in metropolitan Nashville is Democratic. Our governor is Republican. And we are so purple that um, I think it's by design. And I do agree with Adrian on, on trying to keep the focus on the practice of architecture, trying to keep it... Um, to where we can understand where their, where their pinch points are and what that's going to implicate the different policies and procedures that, that these different elected officials are, are putting through to either make it into law or into some kind of code of reg regulation. That's great. I think that's, that, that, that's really helpful. Um, you know, I think here in Ohio, we, we, we definitely relate to the the, the spectrum, you know, there's, there's a, there's a wide range. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good to hear the, you know, variety of experience on this front. Um, Curtis, I'm going to, I'm going to jump back to you and, 
ask if, if, if you would mind sharing a little bit more about the, the policy committee. Uh, you've mentioned it a, a little bit, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about how that operates uh, with regard to the, the broader advocacy uh, group and then what their role is in shaping that agenda uh, for the chapter. Yeah, so our public policy board is the only committee at AIA, well, it's not the only committee, but um, it is the only sort of member committee that's um, by invitation only, so it's not open to everyone. Um, and we pick uh, people who represent primarily uh, an issue. So we have someone to, um, you know, we have several, but focusing on housing. And that's not the only issue they work on. Everyone works on all the issues, but we have some issue experts and that's how we have selected our members. Uh, uh, so again, they meet twice a month. We really go through um, any any updates, any decision points. Um, you know, is there something we need to write a letter on? Is there something we need to reach out to people on? What can our members do on this issue? How can they be involved? We have those kind of discussions. Sometimes we just have kind of random discussions. What are you thinking of? What are you what are you, what are you thinking of about you know that's going on? Um, but they have been very excellent at uh, just providing a nice broad range of experience. Uh, so we try to make sure that we have, as, as um, Adrian said, a residential member um, on there. Um, we, we try to make sure that we have people from big firms versus the small firms um, and do, to do different types of work. And we operate from policy statements. So we have maybe five big policy statements that are um, have gone through the process of um, of constructing them with a lot of feedback, sending them out to all members for feedback, um, and they go to our board and the board approves them. Um, with some, our board does a good job of offering feedback too and having some changes. And once we have those statements on something big like climate or housing, um, the PPB has the latitude to operate however they like within that statement. If they want to go beyond that statement, they have to go back to the, to the board, but that rarely happens. Um, and then, you know, there are times when we realize we need a new statement. Um, after the, um, the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, issue arose last summer, we realized, wow, we need all new statements because we don't do a good enough job of uh, including equity in our statements. So um, then we spend a lot of time again, and we do send them out for feedback. We don't get tons of feedback, but we do do that. Um, and so that's generally how it operates. Uh, it's been, um, I think, pretty successful. We did have one member last in the last six months who stepped down from the ppb because he felt that ideological opinions um opinions outside of the standard seattle ideological you know opinion were not as welcome and i i, I took that very seriously and he was right um but it was interesting to me um, that even within that seattle only sort of bubble we um we also ran afoul of um of feeling that alternative viewpoints weren't as welcome so that's something um, that I would like to work on. It's it's just it's hard when it's such a majority. Um, there's such a majority on the other side. Did I did I get at what you were asking? No, that's great. I, I think that's very helpful. Um, very very helpful. I'd like to I'd like to shift gears um, real quick and 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 jump over to um, Carol and Kelsey. Um, and Whitney and, and ask, you know, a little bit about what the engagement was like there in, in Middle Tennessee and, and maybe specifically um, how you were able to kind of shift the culture of fear about advocacy into a, into a culture of um, engagement with advocacy. And if, if you have any wisdom, you can, you can share about that experience. Kelsey, you start. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. I don't think we've we've not cured the fear. The fear is still there. They they act like they're literally going to be covered in tar, um, and and it will be there forever, scarring them for life. Um, I I think I'll tell them that the antidote was in the COVID nineteen vaccine, and hopefully the majority, seventy percent of them, will have gotten that. And um, I think ARCAPAC. I think that's a good way, giving to your state pack, having those people. I love the concept of the newsletter uh, going out and being the most opened that it was about advocacy. Um, 
I, I feel like if we can get the story of what is the impact with whatever that issue, the engagement happens, it was overwhelming. Um, we've got 800 some odd members in the Middle Tennessee chapter, and we were able to target each of those 40 council members. We knew who was in those districts and who was their voting constituents, and we armed them and they responded. Um, it was a big lift, but I think at the end of the day, I would classify it as a huge win because our members appreciated the effort. Yeah, I think it's very much a work in progress for us, um, but I do think that in some ways, AIA is able to be a little bit of a firewall for people if they don't, you know, if they're not the ones who wanna send an email to their elected official, um, you know, they can at least, again, provide technical expertise for us. They can have kind of um, off the record conversations that allow us to, to be more responsive and sort of shape the way that we craft our messaging and, and all that. Um, I, I mean, I do think that we try to be pretty, um, not delicate necessarily, but I mean, Nashville is a small town in a lot of ways. Um, everybody knows everybody and, and it's a town built on relationships. And so I think recognizing that people are, um, you know, reasonably protective and, um, and careful with those relationships. So finding the ways for us to be that messenger, um, if people aren't comfortable doing that themselves. But I mean, we do also have many members who are perfectly happy being the public messenger. Um, and we're grateful for that. Absolutely. And I think that one thing that, um, I, being new to this, also still kind of find surprising and really uplifting is that our membership, especially the younger people in the EPs, they are really into advocacy and, and a lot of people kind of run from that. But I've um, we did a, a, a membership chapter meeting for our first uh, introductory kind of introducing our committee to the membership. Um, and the turnout was really, really good. And we were surprised because of course, adv advocacy can sometimes be a dry topic and you, <laughs> you don't wanna have a, a Zoom room full of quiet people, but we got a lot of good feedback. We got a lot of interest and um, actually a lot of, uh, of our members just really um, asking questions and wondering, you know, how can they be on top of things and how can they be involved a little bit more? So that was really encouraging for us also. Yeah, that is, it's, that is encouraging. Um, always excited to, to hear the EPs are stepping up and making things happen. Uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about coalition building and um, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how, you know, Kelsey, you, you talked about, you know, reading the, the city council agenda, but how does that relationship start? How do you take it from information and, and data gathering to actual, um, you know, relationship building. And I, I'm just curious what that process looks like, I guess. I think in that particular case, we've leaned on members who a lot of them have been working in the same neighborhood for their entire career um, and are, you know, deeply invested in particular parts of the city and have built those relationships already. And so for them to make that kind of warm introduction um, to AIA as like an institution um, that can sort of broaden that council member's access to other perspectives and other professionals. Um, so I think our members are definitely our, our biggest asset there. So in those, once that relationship is established and once you have those kind of coalitions built, um, I, I guess, how do you, how do you navigate the relationships when, when maybe you don't necessarily see yourselves on the same side of, of a particular issue? Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's another organization that you partner with on one issue and then you kind of find yourself at odds on something else. I wonder, have you, have you experienced that or, or how have you handled that situation? I think a little bit on that lobbyist legislation piece. And I think just being okay in general with saying, you know, not this time um, or just not saying anything. I think sometimes um, by, you know, opting out of signing on to a letter or um, really joining a call, um, it's, 
it's a kind of gentle way to disagree. Um, I don't think that we've come across that a ton, but I think that um, that's definitely a way to, you know, preserve the relationship and say, you know, we're not always going to be on the same page about everything. Um, but when it, you know, when we are, we're stronger together. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to open that up as well. If uh, Adrian and Jonathan or, or Kirsten, if you have anything to add to that. That sounded exactly right to me. Um, that's how we operate too. If we, we work with our organization and there's on a position on something else that we don't feel the same on, we do. I, mean, I generally am quiet about it, but um, I think everyone understands that we all have our own constituencies and. Um, when we come together, we are stronger together. Yeah, I was just going to echo on that. I think the part of that that you, that you had said, Kelsey, that you know, it's it's kind of this mutual respect. So that we all know that we we do have you know a group that we're looking out for in a position, um, and so when when those align, you know, we're we're very strong. And but if if obviously everyone has differences, um, then then we might just step step back, you know, and and just. And, and not engage, but I, but I do think that's one of the things that we we strive, you know, and even you know, I, I would say, Adrian, even in our discussions with with the home builders, you know, there is a certain manner where we, you know, there is I don't know some some avenues where we try and foster some of that, you know, respect for each person's obviously perspective and outlook on it, and 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 know that that's that's what everyone's kind of looking at. Yeah, that's great, Jonathan. Appreciate appreciate that. Um, love to love to dive in a little bit deeper on what what you guys are doing in South Carolina. Um, you know, when we last talked, you, you kind of mentioned this idea of the strike force, and, and and thought that was really an interesting concept. And love if you could unpack the idea of the of the strike force for us and how you utilize that that uh, group to kind of go after different uh, issues. Yeah, um, so we, it used to be just a general thing. Um, it's kind of like pre-repositioning strategic plan of 2015 and after. So before, um, the, we had a Minuteman group, a, a strike force that was um, just our members who had relationships with key legislators. And they would come um, to the state house, usually it was uh, something, you know, happening, uh, legislation and, um, testify. And they, ha they had that, you know, that, that, that gravitas, um, as you can imagine, those were probably the older members, larger firms, um, and they represented, um, you know, these, these, these long standing relationships in, in, in South Carolina, you know, if they, um, you know, if their mothers were in the same sorority or, or, you know, their sons both went to the Citadel. I mean, this is, you know, blood is thicker than water in, in that regard and not literally, you know, familial blood. Um, what we're seeing now is, and we had great success creating a strike force of our K through 12 architects. And this is what we're basing, what we think is going to probably, we're going to let the crayon folks figure it out on their own, but we think they're gonna be our strike force for those issues that are coming, um, lessons learned from earlier this year. So the K through 12 was just a group of about four or five. Um, we just sent it out to, to, to um, um, several firms that we knew did K through 12 work, um, immediately got, you know, their, their in-house, you know, kind of, you know, architects that have just been, you know, doing that for a long time. And we got our lobbyists to get us a meeting with the um, uh, superintendent of education. And what had happened was one of our members had, was driving and heard on the radio during the ca candidacy, during the campaign for that position, um, the, the woman who was successful in becoming superintendent of education talk about stock school plans and maybe that's a great way for the state to save money. And we were like, whoa, 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 we know her. She's not for stock school plans, what the heck? 
So, and this member was just livid. So we immediately got that group together and the lobbyist got us, we met with her within days of that. And it was like a press conference apparently. Um, and what she told us was that her husband's an engineer and she's been getting so much pressure um, in, in the campaign about saving money that she thought, oh, maybe that's a good way to save money. <laughs> so when we, you know, when we were able to sit down with her and now she is in that position, she said, you know, but y'all are going to have to get me the argument for why they're not good because I tell you, I get asked that at the state house almost every day. And so the strike force got together and immediately they met with A4LE, which is another group that we have active here in South Carolina. You all may have there as well. Um, and that's great because you also then get, you know, people outside, not just architects, and immediately got talking points, immediately got data, went to all the, you know, national websites, and we were able to present her head of communications with all that data. And it was just like, you know, it was what she, she asked us. We, we hadn't been asked something so specific before she asked us and now um you know now she really sees us as a resource and her folks call us all the time so it it, it started out as you know we have to strike at while the you know iron's hot on this particular thing with the stuck school plans and then that turned into something else that now we've got her listening to us uh, anything from schools inspections to you know uh, uh, um some codes issues that we've encountered. The school safety, reopening with COVID, all, I mean, the great part was that we suddenly were, you know, that trusted advisor that was now in a role to, to help. And, and she was looking to our group for information that she knew we were, um, you know, our group had the, the knowledge that, that they could uh, give it to her. So that really has been, that, that team has been, and we hope that the construction residential, you know, our crane group, Kind of formulates a similar way so that they you know, they are they are the most knowledgeable for those unique uh elements and then they can then provide that that education piece and, and knowledge piece back to our legislators so that's uh, yeah that was... what, a, what a cool story i mean that that that's incredible um i, I think that's that's really compelling I, and not to not to flip that on its head but i i know adrian you had mentioned um you know a, a, a back that you had experienced earlier this year in terms of um, some legislation in, in South Carolina, but I'm, I'm curious if, if there's any uh, lessons learned out of, out of failure uh, that, that might be good. I know our, our title today is building a successful advocacy program, but a lot of times, you know, learn, learn by doing and learn by failing. So I'm wondering if there are any uh, takeaways from, you know, the, the setbacks or the failures you've experienced. Oh yeah, yeah. I think we've got some some significant battle scars. Again, we kind of thought that it was okay that we were not going to expend our precious political capital on this. What it was is we have an exemption in the South Carolina Architects Practice Act that um, detached one and two family dwellings. Are exempted. So that means home builders don't need an architect, you know, sign and seal if they are um, detached. And one bill that the home builders did, they, they, they threw them both down within hours of each other. And, you know, it felt like in the dead of night too. And all of a sudden these things are like on an agenda almost immediately, which never happens over there. But um, one bill added the word attached and detached. And we were like, what? Then another one just struck detached and just it was one and two family. Um, so we immediately got with the licensing board and they told us, oh yeah, yeah, um, we know that. You know, the home, the home builders have been after, they, they want to do townhomes and they've been after us for years, you know. And, um, and so we know we're monitoring it, but they were getting word from their legislative council that one, they probably didn't have, our licensing board doesn't have any authority, they can't lobby. So you probably don't have any, you can't fight the home builders on this one, they want it, they're gonna get it. Um, and it's not that big a deal because it's by, you know, it, it's, the, it, it's per the prescriptive code, you know, so as the residential code as adopted in South Carolina, so the licensing board thought, oh, that, that sounds reasonable. Well, there are no residential architects on the licensing board. 
So then we get it. We think that is still, you know, we don't like it. And we had a, a committee meeting and we're like, you know, okay, you know, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And we know the hearing we're going to um, uh, uh, activate. And then the building officials, we get word, are meeting with Senate staff on their own without asking us. And they're negotiating to add one, two family, town, homes, yada, yada, per the prescriptive code. And so that happens, it passes, and our lobbyist is like, you know, don't, at this point, you, you're, you're the only ones left standing, don't, you know, it's done, it's a, it's a done deal. The senators are all for this. Um, so that to us is a huge fail when within hours of our licensing board posting uh, um, an email to all licensed architects registered in South Carolina that this is the new thing. We got two emails, um, angry emails from some of our residential. So we realized, okay, we messed up big time. So lessons learned is um, make sure there's a diversity of practitioners on any of your committees. <laughs> Don't assume that because one person is being told you can't fight the home builders that you can't. I don't know that we would have been successful. And, um, you know, anyway, so it, you know, we, we, I mean, the, the, the scars are, are, are seeing, you know, a little daylight, so they're, they're probably going to fade a little bit, but it made us realize, oh, well, we need to do such a better job of making sure that maybe the broader membership, or at least reaching out to our local group, so that what the, you know, what we're doing is we're setting up that um, yet another task force. We've got the K through 12, now we're going to have Korea. And I'll, and I'll add to that, that I think it also just, it, it, it provided us a moment of, of reflection uh, to kind of reassess, you know, kind of what we were doing. I, and the, I, I would also say that we now, we've reached back out to our local sections and our, um, you know, distributing, you know, more transparently, even some of the, so we, each of our local sections has one of their committee members on our calls. Um, but now we're making sure that just in an effort to kind of expand the communication to make sure that we're getting it out to our local sections so that we can get that, that feedback back from them. So, you know, it does, it does hurt when you get, you know, those, those emails of, of dissatisfaction and you feel like, you know, there, there might be, I mean, there was obviously more we could have done, whether we would have been successful or not. But I, I think at the end, we've also, Adrian, you know, to that point, we've reassessed that licensing board and we've looked at, at you know, kind of how we can get more committee members. You know, I, I think what we realized is that we needed, you know, our seat at more tables. And so that's one of the other things that we put towards next year. So, you know, sometimes... That, that knowledge is, is hard, um, hard one when you look back and reflect on it, but um, that's, what, that's what I would take away. At least. And if we're down there, which is why I love Kirsten's idea, like Carol said, of, of this, this more regular outreach. Um, it boiled down to communication. Our local folks felt like they were blindsided. They had no idea this was even happening. And we were so embroiled in it, trying to put out the fires that we forgot to communicate to the members and say, by the way, we're dealing with this issue. Any great ideas, come and help. You know, we, we didn't do that, so. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to step in here a little bit, Matt, and I, it seems like my internet's on a little bit of a delay, but a couple things. Adrian, um, you had commented a little bit about connecting with your PAC board. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe how that's set up, just so we have a little bit of a comparison maybe with how the PAC operates independently or with, um, you know, your, your advocacy group? The PAC board is a separate board. Um, you know, I'm sure it, it, it might be similar in other states where the Ethics Commission requires, you know, the firewall between, I think, it has its own EIN and all that stuff. Um, so they have their, their own board. Um, we have um, the chair, which is our immediate past president. So if you think it takes nine years to, to get into leadership at AI South Carolina, well, there's a 10th because, <laughs> because you have to sit on our PAC board. But we feel like once you have been with the state chapter, then you really know what you're doing and you really know how important it is and you know people that you can reach out to. So, um, um, so the, our immediate past president sits on the, on the 
um, is the chair of the PAC board and sits on the um, uh, advocacy committee. So it's a nice way to have the two uh, groups stay in contact um, and, and kind of see the repercussions so that as um, individual, uh, you know, office holders might, you know, be mentioned in the advocacy committee, the uh, PAC chair is listening and going, aha, um, you know, maybe we need to start looking at that committee as opposed to this committee. So it's just a way to kind of keep um, the, you know, just the umbrella of advocacy and just make sure that we're all, all our tentacles are, you know, on the same squid. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good way of putting that. I've heard a lot of great comments today here. Um, purple by design. There's a few of those I think we'll steal uh, as well. Um, but Kirsten, uh, you, you know, Seattle again, and then the, the state of Washington you, you deal with as well. Uh, how's your PAC connected or not connected to your advocacy efforts? Yeah, we do have a PAC at the state level. It's not anything to emulate. Um, we mutual in that we can collect money from firms for our PAC. Um, I mentioned that at an AIA conference and everyone was like, oh, <laughs> so, so maybe that's not typical. Um, so we actually have to do less outreach to individuals. Um, I, uh, so our pack is not huge. Um, we're certainly, you know, we basically are giving money to our friends, um, our, our close you know, people we work with a lot in the legislature. Um, and we have a goal of making it better and bigger, but um, we haven't got there yet. Great, and, and I'll ask the same question of, of uh, Middle Tennessee, I'll, although I do wanna say I, it's good to see Ashley Cates from AIA uh, Tennessee on here. Uh, she and I were uh, actually connected a long time ago with the first Speak Up conference, I think. So glad to have her online as well. But from Middle Tennessee, you, do you use the, uh, do you have a local pack or is it primarily through the state? We do not have a local pack. Uh, the pack that we have in Tennessee is separate from AIA Tennessee. Um, okay. Currently, we've, we're, we're not um, directly fundraising at the local level for any particular candidate. Like I said, we're 35 counties and metropolitan government has 40 seats on the council. So for us to to take on that within year one, two, and three of existence would probably be a be hag that would maybe send some of us over the edge. Um, so <laughs> we'll, we would be purple by design by holding our breath on that one. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say that it is time to fundraise. And if you haven't given to our local ARCAPAC, there's no time like the present. And the case group, we do have a run for the race and we would love to have you contribute under that realm. So uh, if you haven't given, please do. Well, that's 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 exactly uh, that's exactly right. You know, we we've been pushing back very heavily here in Ohio this year, and uh, I think we're seeing the results of that as well. So uh, you know, it makes a difference when, especially when you have some proactive legislation that that you can uh, support your PAC efforts, uh, that that people can see something as a result. So that's great to hear. I do want to. You know, I know we're getting close to our end time here, but I do want to ask. Um, each of the components, one question. And, you know, this, this, when I'm looking on the screen here and I see Jonathan and I see Whitney and I see Kelsey and, you know, all very young members of, of AIA, um, what do you do to reach out and get other members and bring them in? You know, you know we, Matt asked the question and there's a comment that there are, the EPs are very engaged in that, but how do you get that next generation? How are you working to pull more people into advocacy? Um, we're, Ohio, we're kind of doing it maybe a little bit through these series, we hope, but how are, how are, you, um, how are you going about that to, to get the right people in the mix? I think we've heard a little bit of the answer, but I'm interested in, in saying, what's that next generation look like? Well, I think as we have seen that the, the younger generation is already innately just all about getting things done in all types of realms of our lives right now. Um, I think for us, we're, um, and Kelsey, you can definitely dive in on this, we're starting to incorporate 
more since we're in this Zoom world and this technologically driven um, meetings and things like that, we're starting to incorporate more of the newer ways of kind of getting stuff out, such as podcast and, and things like that. And so we're looking at ways to kind of engage that way. And that way, if they're seeing and hearing what we're doing, um, they're already kind of geared up to kind of jump in on a topic that they're interested in. It doesn't have to be everything that we're working on, but something that they really truly find interest in, such as transit or um, affordable housing or anything in that nature that may come up in our um, realm of legislature and stuff like that, then I think that's really what's getting, driving their attention and getting it. Yeah, I think connecting with our EP committee um, is really valuable. And I think, Ashley, uh, not to bring you into it again, but I think um, at the state level, doing a really great job of making things like Day on the Hill super accessible. Um, it can be obviously really intimidating to connect with people in positions of power. So making that as, as easy as possible, um, especially for our younger members and introducing them to that process um, is going to continue to be an important piece of our work. Well, and I think that's something that we've really found out that uh, going virtual, we were talking about this, I think yesterday that, you know, it, we were forced to do things we never thought we would do. And, and our virtual day at the state house this year probably allowed us to have more members engage with more senators and representatives than we've ever done in the past when we were there uh, in, in, you know, face to face. So uh, we, we're learning a lot of different things and, um, and we're actually um, very pleased to, to have you all here and answer these questions because I think we're all learning something from it. Uh, hopefully I, I'm getting the impression you are as well as us. So it's all a good thing. Um, so um, Karen, I don't know if you have a few closing remarks, but I, I think, uh, I, I think we've kind of come to the end of our questions here to allow everyone to get off at uh, right at 1.30 here. Yeah, thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Matt and Kate, for uh, all your hard work to put this program together. This has been really um, informative, I believe, for us and I, hopefully for everyone joining us. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our panelists for joining us, sharing your inspiring stories about your chapters and your advocacy programs. Um, if you haven't already found the link, there is a link in the chat box where you can register for CEUs for today's program. So I've um, got a few more seconds here to click on that link and, and it, submit that. Um, remember to join us on Wednesday, July 21st. Um, we're going to have our sixth and final session of the 2021 Advocacy Series, Stories of Advocate Architects. So thank you all for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.